Thank you very much. This is always the um, challenging bit to try and capture um, what the content of three really very important, very interesting presentations. And uh, I think a very nice start to this mental health echo because right from the beginning, what these talks have emphasized is if you like broadly, the wide environment, the family context, the, the support context, as well as the community context, the context of the school, all these different environments. And that I think very importantly, takes us away from an excessive, at times excessive focus uh, on the more narrow areas of health. And what both Brian and Marco sort of emphasized is these concepts of well-being and quality of life are much more than is captured in concepts of mental health or mental disorder or mental illness. I think with Brian, I really liked the way you picked up on the, initially on some of the different theories, the wanting theory, the liking theory and the needing theory. I thought they were really lovely ways of thinking about issues of, of well-being. Um, and also that nested model that you showed us, which moved from the subject right outside to values and, and ideology and how you then teased out for us how the impact of hyperphagia, among other things, would impact on subjective um, well-being uh, and then the impact of health and so on and so forth. And, and I have to say, sitting here listening to you, what it made me think is we need to incorporate some of your slides in our report, which we haven't done. So I shall be uh, emailing you, no doubt, uh, about that. But, but I think the way you broke it up um, very nicely helped us think about these issues in a, in a more sensitive and sophisticated way way. So I, I, I thought that was really helpful. Um, Marco, too, I think you then moved us to, to try and I think to argue that quality of life was a, an issue that went beyond well-being. Um, and, and I think one can absolutely see how that is the case. And I, I think you, you, you made the case for that. Um, and then you talked about things like the objective and subjective well-being and, and, and the challenge of that. But Again, I thought it was really nice when you uh, highlighted for us the idea of shared, uh, sorry, objective and subjective quality of life, I should say. But then you highlighted for us shared personal and family quality of life and uh, the, the importance of each of those. And I think the, the tricky bit there, of course, is where concepts of what you know, is good for quality of life and which we appreciate as part of shared quality of life clashes with some of the issues that might be seen as someone's perception their, of their personal quality of life. And those clashes, I think, are something that, that we see within the Prada Willy world, if, 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 you, if you like. So again, I thought you very nicely teased out for us the different ways we might think about different concepts. So these are well-being and quality of life, a, a complex concepts that have had vast areas of research, how we might encapsulate those uh, in, our, in our thinking. And then I think you raised the issue, which you I think you argued that you disagreed with a bit, the relationship between quality of life and human rights and Amartya Sen's work with WHO. And, and I think, again, it is an interesting issue about how human rights might be a vehicle in which you might try and argue the case for having those services and support networks in place to actually support uh, uh, quality of life. And then you had the, the model too, which I thought was rather nice, being, belonging, becoming, you know, those, those sorts of models. And we need those, just like Brian did his, in his presentation, you and yours, Marco, I think gave us some really nice ways of thinking words to hang up these ideas on. And now Sabika, I think you brilliantly illustrated for us in a way why we're having this echo. Um, and in a way, what you, you showed us and described for us is the struggles you've had. And of course, this was your new, you were new parents with new experiences trying to support your daughter with prader willi syndrome. And the question is, can we make things better for the next parent and the next parent and the next parent, wherever they happen to be in the world, so that when their son or daughter 
enters education for the first time in the way that you described, can we make it better for them so that the issues that you describe um, can be addressed? And, and, if you, and I thought you put it very nicely that what you were thinking about in preparing your presentation is what make, I think you said something like what makes me anxious or what made, you know, I essentially kept you awake at night, I'm sure that already your anxiety is higher having, having a child with special needs, but what other things made you more anxious? So the school environment, you described this integration to mainstream without any support and the consequences uh, on your daughter of, of that. Um, and I think also, in a sense, uh, and I, I thought your description of the outbursts in school and the response being, get on the phone really to phone you or phone the parent and say, you know, in a sense, come and get my, my child because without ever trying to think through quite what's going on. And it seems to me that's the area that's really important. How can, how can we help teachers and so on? step back a bit and say what's going on here um, and how can they work with parents to to try and prevent and manage these issues um, more importantly and you talked about the lack of communication the lack of understanding and the lack of support all areas that i think ring bells many times over and, and we've heard from families and professionals too from across the world so um, if I can just thank all, all three people, because I thought they, the talks all fitted very well together and is a really very nice start to this mental health uh, echo. So I've tried to capture some of the points there.